Chapter Sixteen, Part One of The Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Life of Abraham Lincoln by Ward Hill Lehman. Chapter 16. Part 1. Although primarily responsible for all that had taken place in Kansas, Mr. Douglas appeared to be suddenly animated by a new and burning zeal in behalf of the Free State Party in the Territory. It struck him very forcibly, just when he needed most to be struck by a new idea, that the Lecompton Constitution was not, quote, the act and deed of the people of Kansas, end quote. Accordingly, Mr. Douglas took his stand against Lecompton at the first note of the long conflict in Congress. We shall make no analysis of the debates nor set out the votes of senators and representatives which marked the intervals of that fierce struggle between sections parties and factions which followed it is enough to say here that mr douglas was found speaking and voting with the republicans upon every phase of the question he had but one or two followers in the senate and a mere handful in the house yet these were faithful to his lead until a final conference committee and the English bill afforded an opportunity for some of them to escape. For himself, he scorned all compromises, voted against the English bill, and returned to Illinois to ask the votes of the people upon a winter's record wholly and consistently anti-democratic. The fact is mentioned not to obscure the fame of the statesman, nor to impugn the honesty of the politician but because it had an important influence upon the canvas of the ensuing summer. During the winter Mr. Douglas held frequent consultations with the leaders of the Republican Party. Their meetings were secret, and for that reason the more significant. By this means harmony of action was secured for the present, and something provided for the future. Mr. Douglas covertly announced himself as a convert to the Republicans, declared his uncompromising enmity to the slave power, and said that, however, he might be distrusted then, he would be seen fighting their battles in 1860. But for the time he thought it wise to conceal his ultimate intentions. He could manage the democracy more effectually by remaining with them until better opportunities should occur. Quote, he insisted, that he would never be driven from the party, but would remain in it until he exposed the administration and the disunionists, and, when he went out, he would go of his own accord. He was in the habit of remarking that it was policy for him to remain in the party, in order to hold certain of the rank and file, so that, if he went over from the democracy to any other party, he would be able to take the crowd along with him, and, when he got them all over, he would cut down the bridges and sink the boats. End quote. When asked if he knew precisely where his present course was taking him, he answered repeatedly, quote, I do, and I have checked all my baggage, and taken a thorough ticket. End quote. He was a proselyte not to be despised. His weight might be sufficient to turn the scale in the presidential election. The Republicans were naturally pleased with his protestations of friendship, and more than pleased with his proffers of active service. But he was not content with this alone. He contrived to convince many of his late opponents that the Kansas-Nebraska bill itself was actually conceived in the interests of anti-slavery, and that the device was the most cunning of political tricks, intended to give back to freedom all the vast expanse of territory which the Missouri line had dedicated forever to slavery. Quote, Mr. Douglas's plan for destroying the Missouri line 
said one Republican, and thereby opening the way for the march of freedom beyond the limits forever prohibited by that line, and the opening up of free states and territory which it was concluded belonged to the slave states, and its march westward, embracing the whole line of the Pacific, from the British possessions to Mexico, struck me as the most magnificent scheme ever conceived by the human mind. This character of conversation, so frequently employed by Mr. Douglas, with those with whom he talked, made the deepest impression upon their minds, enlisted them in his behalf, and changed in almost every instance their opinion of the man. End quote. In support of this view, Mr. Douglas could point to Kansas, where the battle under his bill was being fought out. The free state men had, perhaps from the very beginning, been in the majority, and could take possession of the territory, or the new state, as the case might be, whenever they could secure a fair vote. The laboring classes of the North were the natural settlers of the Western territories. If these failed in numbers, the enormous and increasing European immigration was at their back, and, if both together failed, the churches, aid societies, and anti-slavery organizations were at hand to raise arm and equip great bodies of immigrants, as they would regular forces for a public purpose. The South had no such facilities. Its social, political, and material conditions made a sudden exodus of its voting population to new countries a thing impossible. It might send here a man with a few negroes, and there another, it might insist vehemently upon its supposed rights in the common territories, and be ready to fight for them, but it could never cover the surface of those territories with cozy farmsteads or crowd them with intelligent and muscular white men, and yet these last would inevitably give political character to the rising communities. Such clearly were to be the results of popular sovereignty as Mr. Douglas had had up to that time maintained it under the Nebraska Bill. It signified the right of the people of a territory, quote, to form and regulate their domestic institutions in their own way, end quote, when, and not before, they came to frame a state constitution. The Missouri line, on the contrary, had been a sort of convention, which, by common consent, gave all north of it to freedom, and all south of it to slavery. But popular sovereignty disregarded all previous compacts, all ordinances, and all laws. With this doctrine in practice, the North were sure to be visitors in every serious contest. But when Mr. Douglas changed ground again, and popular sovereignty became squatter sovereignty, he had reason to boast himself the most efficient, although the wiliest and coolest, anti-slavery agitator on the continent. The new doctrine implied the right of a handful of settlers to determine the slavery question in their first legislature. It made no difference whether they did this by direct or unfriendly legislation. The result was the same. Quote, popular sovereignty, popular sovereignty, said Mr. Lincoln. Let us for a moment inquire into this vast matter of popular sovereignty. What is popular sovereignty? We recollect that, in an early period in the history of the struggle, there was another name for the same thing, squatter sovereignty. It was not exactly popular sovereignty, squatter sovereignty. What do these terms mean? What do these terms mean when used now? And vast credit is taken by our friend, the judge, in regard to his support of it, when he declares the last years of his life have been, and all the future years of his life shall be, devoted to this matter of popular sovereignty. What is it? Why, it is the sovereignty of the people. What was squatter sovereignty? I suppose, if it had any significance at all, it was the right of the people to govern themselves, to be sovereign in their own affairs, while they were squatted down in a country not their own while they had squatted on a territory that did not belong to them, in the sense that a state belongs to the people who inhabit it 
when it belongs to the nation. Such right to govern themselves was called squatter sovereignty. End quote. Again, and on another occasion, but still before Mr. Douglas had submitted squatter for popular sovereignty, a feat which was not performed until September 1859, Mr. Lincoln said, quote, I suppose almost every one knows that in this controversy, whatever has been said has reference to Negro slavery. We have not been in a controversy about the right of the people to govern themselves in the ordinary matters of domestic concern in the states and territories. Mr. Buchanan, in one of his late messages, I think when he sent up the Lecompton Constitution, urged that the main point to which the public attention had been directed was not in regard to the great variety of small domestic matters, but it was directed to the Negro slavery. And he asserts that, if the people had had a fair chance to vote on that question, there was no reasonable ground of objection in regard to minor questions. Now, while I think that the people had not been given them, or offered them, a fair chance upon that slavery question, still, if there had been a fair submission to a vote upon that main question, the President's proposition would have been true to the uttermost. Hence, when hereafter I speak of popular sovereignty, I wish to be understood as applying what I say to the question of slavery only, not to other minor domestic matters of a territory or a state. Does Judge Douglas, when he says that several of the past years of his life have been devoted to the question of popular sovereignty, and that all the remainder of his life shall be devoted to it, does he mean to say that he has been devoting his life to securing to the people of the territories the right to exclude slavery from the territories? If he means so to say, he means to deceive, because he and every one knows that the decision of the Supreme Court, which he approves, it makes an especial ground of attack upon me for disapproving, forbids the people of a territory to exclude slavery. This covers the whole ground, from the settlement of a territory till it reaches the degree of maturity entitling it to form a state constitution. So far as all that ground is concerned, the judge is not sustaining popular sovereignty, but absolutely opposing it. He sustains the decision which declares that the popular will of the territories has no constitutional power to exclude slavery during their territorial existence. This being so, the period of time from the first settlement of a territory till it reaches the point of forming a state constitution is not the thing the judge has fought for, or is fighting for, but on the contrary, he has fought for, and is fighting for, the thing that annihilates and crushes out that same popular sovereignty. End quote. It is probable that in the numerous private conferences held by Mr. Douglas with Republican leaders in the winter of 1857 and 58, he managed to convince them that it was, after all, not popular sovereignty, but squatter sovereignty, that he meant to advance as his final and inevitable deduction from the great principles of the Nebraska Bill. This he knew, and they were sure, would give anti-slavery an unbroken round of solid victories in all the territories. The South feared it much more than they did the Republican theory. It was, in the language of their first orator, a shortcut to all the ends of sewardism. But Mr. Douglas's great difficulty was to produce any belief in his sincerity. At home, in Illinois, the Republicans distrusted him almost to a man, and at Washington, among his peers in the Senate and the House, it seemed necessary for him to repeat his plans and promises very often, and to mingle with them bitter and passionate declamations against the South. At last, however, he succeeded, partially at least. Senator Wilson believed him devoutly. Mr. Burlingame said his record was laid up in light. Mr. Colfax, Mr. Blair, and Mr. Covode were convinced 
and gentlemen of the press began industriously to prepare the way for his entrance into the republican party mr greeley was thoroughly possessed by the new idea and went about propagating and enforcing it with all his might among all the grave counsellors employed in furthering mr douglas's defection it is singular that only one man of note steadily resisted his admission to a place of leadership in the republican ranks judge trumbull could not be persuaded he had no faith in the man who proposed to desert and had some admonitions to deliver based upon the history of recent events he was willing enough to take him on probation but wholly opposed to giving him any power covode was employed to mollify judge trumbull but he met with no success and went away without so much as delivering the message with which mr douglas had charged him the message was a simple proposition of alliance with the home republicans to the effect that if they agreed to return him to the senate in eighteen fifty eight he would fight their presidential battle in eighteen sixty judge trumbull did not even hear it but he was well assured that mr douglas was quote, an applicant for an admission into the republican party end quote. Quote, it was reported to me at that time said he that such was the fact and such appeared to be the universal understanding among the republicans at washington i will state another fact i almost quarrelled with some of my best republican friends in regard to this matter i was willing to receive judge douglas into the republican party on probation but i was not as these republican friends were willing to receive him and place him at the head of our ranks End quote. toward the latter part of april eighteen fifty eight a democratic state convention met in illinois and besides nominating a ticket for state officers endorsed mr douglas this placed him in the field for re-election as an anti lecompton democrat but it was by no means shook the faith of his recently acquired republican friends they thought it very natural under the circumstances that his ways should be a little devious and his policy somewhat dark he had always said he could do more for them by seeming to remain within their democratic party and he looked upon this latest proceeding his practical nomination by a democratic convention as the foundation for an act of stupendous treason between that time and the presidential election they continued to press the republicans of illinois to make no nomination against him to vote for him to trust him to allow him as a sincere and manifestly a powerful anti-slavery leader these representations had the effect of seducing away for a brief period mr washburn and a few others among the lesser politicians of the state but when they found the party at large irrevocably opposed to the scheme they reluctantly acquiesced in what they could not prevent mr lincoln's nomination but the plot made a profound impression on mr lincoln's mind it proved the existence of personal qualities in mr douglas which to a simpler man were unimaginable and inexplicable a gentleman once inquired of mr lincoln what he thought of douglas's chances at charleston quote, well he replied were it not for certain matters that i know transpired which i regarded at one time among the impossibilities i would say he stood no possible chance i refer to the fact that in the illinois contest with myself he had the sympathy and support of greeley of burlingame and of wilson of massachusetts and other leading republicans that at the same time he received the support of wise and the influence of breckinridge and other southern men they took direct issue with the administration and secured against all its power one hundred and twenty five thousand out of one hundred and thirty thousand democratic votes cast in the state a man that can bring such influence to bear with his own exertions may play the devil at charleston End quote. from the seventeenth to the sixteenth of june eighteen fifty eight mr lincoln was busily engaged writing a speech he wrote it in scraps a sentence now and another again 
It was originally scattered over numberless little pieces of paper, and was only reduced to consecutive sheets and connected form as the hour for its delivery drew near. It was to be spoken on or about the 16th, when the Republican State Convention would assemble at Springfield, and, as Mr. Lincoln anticipated, would nominate him for Senator in Congress. About the 13th of June, Mr. Dubois, the State Auditor, entered the office of Lincoln and Herndon, and found Mr. Lincoln deeply intent upon the speech. Quote, Hello, Lincoln. What are you writing? said the Auditor. Come, tell me. End quote. Quote, I shan't tell you, said Lincoln. It is none of your business, Mr. Auditor. Come, sit down, and let's be jolly. End quote. On the 16th, the convention, numbering with delegates and alternates, about a thousand men, met and passed unanimously the following resolution. Quote, that Honorable Abraham Lincoln is our first and only choice for United States Senator to fill the vacancy about to be created by the expiration of Mr. Douglas's term of office. End quote. That evening, Mr. Lincoln came early to his office, along with Mr. Herndon having carefully locked the door and put the key in his own pocket he pulled from his bosom the manuscript of the speech and proceeded to read it slowly and distinctly when he had finished the first paragraph he came to a dead pause and turned to his astounded auditor with the inquiry quote, how do you like that what do you think of it End quote. Quote, i think returned mr herndon it is true but is it entirely politic to read or speak it as it is written? End quote. Quote, that makes no difference, Mr. Lincoln said. That expression is a truth of all human experience. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And he that runs may read. The proposition is indisputably true. It has been true for more than six thousand years. And I will deliver it as written. I want to use some universally known figure, expressed in a simple language, as universally known, that may strike home to the minds of men, in order to rouse them to the peril of the times. I would rather be defeated with this expression in the speech, and held it up in disgust before the people, than to be victorious without it. End quote. It may be questioned whether Mr. Lincoln had a clear right to indulge in such a venture, as a representative party man in a close contest. He had other interests than his own in charge. He was bound to respect the opinions, and, if possible, secure the success of the party which had made him its leader. He knew that this strange doctrine, so strikingly enunciated, would alienate many well-affected voters. Was it his duty to cast these away, or to keep them? He was not asked to sacrifice any principle of the party, or any opinion of his own previously expressed, but merely to forego the trial of an experiment, to withhold the announcement of a startling theory, and to leave the creed of the party as it came from the hands of its makers, without this individual supplement, of which they had never dreamed. It is evident that he had not always been insensible to the force of this reasoning, at the Bloomington Convention he had uttered the same ideas and almost the same words, and their novelty, their tendency, their recognition of a state of incipient civil war in a country for the most part profoundly peaceful, these and the bloody work which might come of their acceptance by a great party, had filled the minds of some of his hearers with the most painful apprehensions. The theory was equally shocking to them whether as partisans or as patriots. Among them was Honorable T. Lyle Dickey, who sought Mr. Lincoln and begged him to suppress them in future. He vindicated his speech, as he has just vindicated it in the interview with Mr. Herndon, but, after much persuasion, promised at length not to repeat it. It was now Mr. Herndon's turn to be surprised. The pulpit had outstripped the teacher, he was intensely anxious for Mr. Lincoln's election. He feared the effect of this speech, and yet it was so exactly in accordance with his own faith, 
that he could not advise him to suppress it. It might be heresy to many others, but it was orthodoxy to him, and he was in the habit of telling the whole truth, without regard to consequences. If it cost a single defeat now, he was sure that its potency would one day be felt, and the wisdom of its present utterance acknowledged. He therefore urged Mr. Lincoln to speak it as he had written it, and to treat with the scorn of a prophet those who, having ears, would not hear, and having eyes, would not see. The advice was not unacceptable, but Mr. Lincoln thought he owed it to other friends to counsel with them also. About a dozen gentlemen were called to meet in the library room in the State House. Quote, After seating them at the round table, says John Armstrong, one of the number, he read that clause or section of his speech which reads, A house divided against itself cannot stand, etc. He read it slowly and cautiously, so as to let each man fully understand it. After he had finished the reading, he asked the opinions of his friends as to the wisdom or policy of it. Every man among them condemned the speech in substance and spirit, and especially that section quoted above. They unanimously declared that the whole speech was too far in advance of the times, and they all condemned that section or part of his speech already quoted as unwise and impolitic, if not false. William H. Herndon sat still while they were giving their respective opinions of its unwisdom and impolicy. Then he sprang to his feet and said, Lincoln, deliver it just as it reads. If it is in advance of the times, let us, you and I, if no one else, lift the people to the level of the speech, now, higher ever after. The speech is true, wise, and politic, and will succeed now or in the future. Nay, it will aid you, if it will not make you President of the United States. Mr. Lincoln sat still a short moment, rose from his chair, walked backwards and forwards in the hall, stopped, and said, Friends, I have thought about this matter a great deal, have weighed the question well from all corners, and am thoroughly convinced that the time has come when it should be uttered, and if it must be that I must go down because of this speech, then let me go down linked to truth, die in the advocacy of what is right and just. This nation cannot live on injustice. A house divided against itself cannot stand, I say again and again. This was spoken with some degree of emotion, the effects of his love of truth and sorrow from the disagreement of his friends with himself. End quote. On the evening of the 17th, the celebrated speech, known since as the House Divided Against Itself speech, was delivered to an immense audience in the hall of the House of Representatives. Mr. Lincoln never penned words which had a more prodigious influence upon the public mind, or which more directly and powerfully affected his own career. It was as follows. Gentlemen of the Convention, if we could first know where we are, and whither we are tending, we could then better judge what to do, and how to do it. We are now far on into the fifth year since a policy was initiated, with the avowed object and confident promise of putting an end to slavery agitation. Under the operation of that policy, that agitation had not only ceased, but has constantly augmented, in my opinion, under the operation of that policy, that agitation had not only not ceased, but has constantly augmented. In my opinion, it will not cease until a crisis shall have been reached and passed. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free, and do not expect the Union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing, or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the farther spread of it, and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in course of ultimate extinction, or its advocates will push it forward 
till it shall become alike lawful in all the states old as well as new north as well as south here we have no tendency to the latter condition that any one who doubts carefully contemplate that now almost complete legal combination piece of machinery so to speak compounded of the nebraska doctrine and the dred scott decision let him consider not only what work the machinery is adapted to do and how well adapted but also let him study the history of its construction and trace if he can or rather fail if he can to trace the evidence of design and concert of action among its chief master workers from the beginning but so far congress only had acted and an endorsement by the people real or apparent was indispensable to save the point already gained and give chance for more the new year of eighteen fifty four found slavery excluded from more than half the states by state constitutions and from most of the national territory by congressional prohibition four days later commenced the struggle which ended in repealing that congressional prohibition this opened all the national territory to slavery and was the first point gained this necessity had not been overlooked but had been provided for as well as might be in the notable argument of squatter sovereignty otherwise called sacred right of self-government which latter phrase though expressive of the only rightful basis of any government was so perverted in this attempted use of it as to amount to just this that if any one man chose to enslave another no third man shall be allowed to object that argument was incorporated into the nebraska bill itself in the language which follows quote, it being the true intent and meaning of this act not to legislate slavery into any territory or state nor exclude it therefrom but to leave the people thereof perfectly free to form and regulate their domestic institutions in their own way subject only to the constitution of the united states End quote. then opened the roar of loose declamation in favor of squatter sovereignty and sacred rights of self-government quote, but said opposition members let us be more specific let us amend the bill so as to expressly declare that the people of the territory may exclude slavery End quote. Quote, not we said the friends of the measure and down they voted the amendment while the nebraska bill was passing through congress a law case involving the question of a negro's freedom by reason of his owner having voluntarily taken him first into a free state and then a territory covered by the congressional prohibition and held him as a slave for a long time in each was passing through the united states circuit court for the district of missouri and both the nebraska bill and lawsuit were brought to a decision in the same month of may eighteen fifty four the negro's name was dred scott which name now designates the decision finally made in the case before the then next presidential election the law case came to and was argued in the supreme court of the united states but the decision of it was deferred until after the election still before the election senator trumbull on the floor of the senate request the leading advocate of the nebraska bill to state his opinion whether a people of a territory can constitutionally exclude slavery from their limits and the latter answers quote, that is a question for the supreme court End quote. the election came mr buchanan was elected and the endorsement such as it was secured that was the second point gained the endorsement however fell short of a clear popular majority by nearly four hundred thousand votes and so perhaps was not overwhelmingly reliable and satisfactory the outgoing president in his last annual message as impressively as possible echoed back upon the people the weight and authority of the endorsement the supreme court met again did not announce their decision but ordered a re-argument the presidential inauguration came and still no decision of the court but the incoming president in his inaugural address 
fervently exhorted the people to abide by the forthcoming decision, whatever it might be. Then, in a few days, came the decision. This was the third point gained. The reputed author of the Nebraska Bill finds an early occasion to make a speech at this capital endorsing the Dred Scott decision, and vehemently denouncing all opposition to it. The new president, too, seizes the early occasion of the Silliman letter to endorse and strongly construe that decision, and to express his astonishment that any different view had ever been entertained. At length a squabble springs up between the president and the author of the Nebraska bill, on the mere question of the fact whether the Lee Compton Constitution was, or was not, in any just sense, made by the people of Kansas, and in that squabble, the latter declares that all he wants is a fair vote for the people, and that he cares not whether slavery be voted down or voted up. I do not understand his declaration, that he cares not whether slavery be voted down or voted up, to be intended by him other than as an apt definition of the policy he would impress upon the public mind, the principle for which he declares he has suffered much, and is ready to suffer to the end. And well may he cling to that principle, if he has any parental feeling, well may he cling to it. That principle is the only shred left of his original Nebraska doctrine. Under the Dred Scott decision, squatter sovereignty squatted out of existence, tumbled down like temporary scaffolding like the mold at the foundry, served through the one blast, and fell back into loose sand, helped to carry an election, and then was kicked to the winds. His late joint struggle with the Republicans against the Lecompton Constitution involves nothing of the original Nebraska doctrine. That struggle was made on a point, the right of a people to make their own constitution, upon which he and the Republicans have never differed. End of chapter 16, part 1. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Chapter 16, part 2 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Life of Abraham Lincoln by Ward Hill Lehman. Chapter 16, Part 2. The several points of the Dred Scott decision, in connection with Senator Douglas's care-not policy, constitute the piece of machinery in its present state of advancement. The working points of that machinery are, first, that no Negro slave, imported as such from Africa, and no descendant of such, can ever be a citizen of any state, in the sense of that term as used in the Constitution of the united states this point is made in order to deprive the negro in every possible event of the benefit of this provision of the united states constitution which declares that quote, the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all the privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states End quote. secondly that Quote, subject to the Constitution of the United States, end quote. neither Congress nor a territorial legislature can exclude slavery from any United States territory. This point is made in order that individual men may fill up the territories with slaves, without danger of losing them as property, and thus to enhance the chances of permanency to the institution through all the future. Thirdly, that whether the holding a negro in actual slavery in a free state makes him free as against the holder the united states courts will not decide but will leave it to be decided by the courts of any slave state the negro may be forced into by the master 
This point is made, not to be pressed immediately, but if acquiesced in for a while, and apparently endorsed by the people at an election, then to sustain the logical conclusion that, what Dred Scott's master might lawfully do with Dred Scott, in the free state of Illinois, every other master may lawfully do with any other one or one thousand slaves in Illinois, or in any other free state. Auxiliary to all this, and working hand in hand with it, the Nebraska doctrine, or what is left of it, is to educate and mould public opinion, at least northern public opinion, not to care whether slavery is voted down or voted up. This shows exactly where we now are, and partially, also, whither we are tending. It will throw additional light on the latter to go back and run the mind over the string of historical facts already stated. Several things will now appear less dark and mysterious than they did when they were transpiring. The people were to be left perfectly free, subject only to the Constitution. What the Constitution had to do with it, outsiders could not then see. Plainly enough now, it was an exactly fitted niche for the Dred Scott decision afterward to come in, and declare that perfect freedom of the people to be just no freedom at all. Why was the amendment expressly declaring the right of the people to exclude slavery voted down? Plainly enough now, the adoption of it would have spoiled the niche for the Dred Scott decision. Why was the court decision held up? Why even a senator's individual opinion withheld till after the presidential election? Plainly enough now, the speaking out then would have damaged the perfectly free argument upon which the election was to be carried. Why the outgoing president's felicitation on the endorsement? Why the delay of a re-argument? Why the incoming president's advance exhortation in favor of the decision? These things look like the cautious padding and petting of a spirited horse preparatory to mounting him, when it is dreaded that he may give the rider a fall, and why the hasty after-endorsements of the decision by the President and others. We cannot absolutely know that all these exact adaptations are the result of pre-concert, but when we see a lot of frame timbers, different portions of which we know have been gotten out at different times and places, and by different workmen, stephen franklin roger and james for instance and when we see these timbers joined together and see they exactly make the frame of a house or a mill all the tenons and mortises exactly fitting and all the lengths and proportions of the different pieces exactly adapted to their respective places and not a piece too many or too few not omitting even scaffolding or if a single piece be lacking we can see the place in the frame exactly fitted and prepared to yet bring such peace in. In such a case, we find it impossible not to believe that Stephen and Franklin and Roger and James all understood one another from the beginning, and all worked upon a common plan or draft drawn up before the first blow was struck. It should not be overlooked that, by the Nebraska Bill, the people of a state as well as territory were to be left perfectly free, subject only to the Constitution. Why mention a state? They were legislating for territories, and not for or about states. Certainly the people of a state are and ought to be subject to the Constitution of the United States. But why is mention of this lugged into this merely territorial law? Why are the people of a territory and the people of a state therein lumped together? and their relation to the Constitution therein treated as being precisely the same. While the opinion of the Court by Chief Justice Taney in the Dred Scott case, and the separate opinions of all the concurring judges, expressly declare that the Constitution of the United States neither permits Congress nor a territorial legislature to exclude slavery from any United States territory, they all omit to declare whether or not the same constitution permits a state, or the people of a state, to exclude it. Possibly this was a mere omission, but who can be quite sure, if McLean or Curtis had sought to get into the opinion a declaration of unlimited power in the people of a state, 
to exclude slavery from their limits, just as Chase and Mace sought to get such declaration, in behalf of the people of a territory, into the Nebraska Bill. I ask, who can be quite sure that it would not have been voted down in the one case as it had been in the other? The nearest approach to the point of declaring the power of a state over slavery is made by Judge Nelson. He approaches it more than once, using the precise idea, and almost the language, too, of the Nebraska Act. On one occasion his exact language is, except in cases where the power is restrained by the Constitution of the United States, the law of the state is supreme over the subject of slavery within its jurisdiction. In what cases the power of the state is so restrained by the United States Constitution is left an open question, precisely as the same question as to the restraint on the power of the territories was left open in the Nebraska Act. Put that and that together, and we have another nice little niche which we may ere long see filled with another Supreme Court decision, declaring that the Constitution of the United States does not permit a state to exclude slavery from its limits, and this may especially be expected if the doctrine of quote, care not whether slavery be voted down or voted up end quote, shall gain upon the public mind sufficiently to give promise that such a decision can be maintained when made. Such a decision is all that slavery now lacks of being alike lawful in all the states. Welcome or unwelcome, such decision is probably coming, and will soon be upon us, unless the power of the present political dynasty shall be met and overthrown. We shall lie down pleasantly dreaming that the people of Missouri are on the verge of making their state free, and we shall awake to the reality instead that the Supreme Court has made Illinois a slave state. To meet and overthrow the power of that dynasty is the work now before all those who will prevent that consummation. That is what we have to do. But how can we best do it? There are those who denounce us openly to their own friends, and yet whisper softly that Senator Douglas is the aptest instrument there is with which to effect that object. They do not tell us, nor has he told us, that he wishes any such object to be effected. They wish us to infer all, from the facts that he now has a little quarrel with the present head of the dynasty, and that he has regularly voted with us on a single point, upon which he and we have never differed. They remind us that he is a very great man, and that the largest of us are very small ones. Let this be granted, but, quote, a living dog is better than a dead lion, end quote. Judge Douglas, if not a dead lion for this work, is at least a caged and toothless one. How can he oppose the advances of slavery? He don't care anything about it. His avowed mission is impressing the public heart to care nothing about it. A leading Douglas Democrat newspaper thinks Douglas's superior talent will be needed to resist the revival of the African slave trade. Does Douglas believe an effort to revive that trade is approaching? He has not said so. Does he really think so? But, if it is, how can he resist it? For years, he has labored to prove it a sacred right of white men to take Negro slaves into the new territories. Can he possibly show that it is less a sacred right to buy them where they can be bought cheapest? And unquestionably, they can be bought cheaper in Africa than in Virginia. He has done all in his power to reduce the whole question of slavery to one of a mere right of property and as such how can he oppose the foreign slave trade how can he refuse that trade in that property shall be perfectly free unless he does it as a protection to the home production and as the home producers will probably not ask the protection he will be wholly without a ground of opposition senator douglas holds we know that a man may rightfully be wiser today than he was yesterday that he may rightfully change when he finds himself wrong. But can we, for that reason, run ahead and infer that he will make any particular change, of which he himself has given no intimation? Can we safely base our action upon any such vague references? 
Now, as ever, I wish not to misrepresent Judge Douglas's position, question his motives, or do aught that can be personally offensive to him. Whenever, if ever, he and we can come together on principle, so that our great cause may have assistance from his great ability, I hope to have interposed no adventitious obstacle. But clearly he is not now with us, he does not pretend to be, he does not promise ever to be. Our cause, then, must be entrusted to, and conducted by, its own undoubted friends, those whose hands are free, whose hearts are in the work, who do care for the result. Two years ago the Republicans of the nation mustered over 1,300,000 strong. We did this under the single impulse of resistance to a common danger, with every external circumstance against us, of strange, discordant, and even hostile elements, we gathered from the four winds, and formed and fought the battle through, under the constant hot fire of a disciplined, proud, and pampered enemy. Did we brave all then to falter now? Now, when that same enemy is wavering, dissevered, and belligerent. The result is not doubtful. We shall not fail. If we stand firm, we shall not fail. Wise counsels may accelerate or mistakes delay it, but, sooner or later, the victory is sure to come. The speech produced a profound impression upon men of all parties. The Democrats rejoiced in it, and reprobated it. The conservative Republicans received it coldly, and saw in it the sign of certain defeat. In the eyes of the latter, it was a disheartening mistake at the outset of a momentous campaign, a fatal error which no policy or exertion could retrieve alone of all those directly affected by it the abolitionists the compatriots of mr herndon heard in it the voice of a fearless leader who had the wisdom to comprehend an unwelcome fact and the courage to proclaim it at the moment when the delusion of fancied security and peace was most generally and fondly entertained it was the irrepressible conflict which Mr. Seward had been preaching, and to which the one party had given almost as little credit as the other. Except a few altruists here and there, nobody as yet had actually prepared his armor for this imaginary conflict, to which the nation was so persistently summoned, and, indeed, none but those few seriously believed in the possibility of its existence. The Republican Party had heretofore disavowed the doctrine with a unanimity nearly as great as that exhibited by the little council of Mr. Lincoln's immediate friends. It was therefore to be expected that, when a slow, cautious, moderate man like Mr. Lincoln came forward with it in this startling fashion, it would carry dismay to his followers and a cheering assurance to his enemies. But Mr. Lincoln was looking farther than this campaign. He was quietly dreaming of the presidency, and edging himself to a place in advance, where he thought the tide might take him up in 1860. He was sure that sectional animosities, far from subsiding, would grow deeper and stronger with time, and for that reason the next nominee of the exclusively Northern Party must be a man of radical views. Quote, I think says Mr. Herndon, the speech was intended to take the wind out of Seward's sails, end quote. and Mr. Herndon is not alone in his opinion. A day or two after Mr. Lincoln spoke, one Dr. Long came into his office, and delivered to him a foretaste of the remarks he was doomed to hear for several months. Quote, well, Lincoln, said he, that foolish speech of yours will kill you, will defeat you in this contest and probably for all offices for all time to come. I am sorry, sorry, very sorry. I wish it was wiped out of existence. Don't you wish it now? End quote. Mr. Lincoln had been writing during the doctor's lament, but at the end of it he laid down his pen, raised his head, lifted his spectacles, and, with a look half quizzical, half contemptuous, replied, quote, Well, doctor, if I had to draw a pen across and erase my whole life from existence, and I had one poor gift or choice left as to what I should say from the wreck, I should choose that speech 
and leave it to the world unerased. End quote. Leonard Swett, than whom there was no more gifted man nor a better judge of political affairs in Illinois, is convinced that quote, the first ten lines of that speech defeated him. The sentiment of the house divided against itself seemed wholly inappropriate, says Mr. Swett. It was a speech made at the commencement of a campaign, and apparently made for the campaign. Viewing it in the sled alone, nothing could have been more unfortunate or inappropriate. It was saying first the wrong thing. Yet he saw that it was an abstract truth, and standing by the speech would ultimately find him in the right place. I was inclined at the time to believe these words were hastily and inconsiderately uttered, but subsequent facts have convinced me they were deliberate, and had been matured. In the summer of 1859, when he was dining with a party of his intimate friends at Bloomington, the subject of his Springfield speech was discussed. We all insisted that it was a great mistake, but he justified himself and finally said, Well, gentlemen, you may think that speech was a mistake, but I never have believed it was, and you will see the day when you will consider it was the wisest thing I ever said. End quote. John T. Stewart was a family connection of the Todds and Edwardses, and thus also of Lincoln. Mr. C. C. Brown married Mr. Stewart's daughter, and speaks of Mr. Lincoln as our relative. This gentleman says, quote, The Todd Stewart Edwards family, with preacher and priest, dogs and servants, got mad at Mr. Lincoln because he made the house divided against itself speech. He flinched, dodged, said he would explain, and did explain, in the Douglas debates. End quote. But it was difficult to explain. Explanations of the kind are generally more hurtful than the original offense. Accordingly, Mr. Herndon reports in his broad, blunt way that, quote, Mr. Lincoln met with many cold shoulders for some time, nay, during the whole canvass with Douglas. End quote. At the great public meetings which characterized that campaign, quote, you could hear, from all quarters in the crowd, Republicans saying, Damn that fool speech! It will be the cause of the death of Lincoln and the Republican Party. Such folly! Such nonsense! Damn it! End quote. Since 1840, Lincoln and Douglas had appeared before the people, almost as regularly as the elections came round, to discuss, the one against the other, the merits of parties, candidates, and principles. Thus far, Mr. Lincoln had been in a certain sense the pursuer. He had lain in wait for Mr. Douglas. He had caught him at unexpected turns and upon sharp points. He had mercilessly improved the advantage of Mr. Douglas's long record in Congress to pick apart and to criticize, while his own was so much more humble and less extensive. But now at last they were abreast, candidates for the same office with a fair field and equal opportunities. It was the great crisis in the lives of both. Let us see what they thought of each other, and, in the extracts which convey the information, we may also get a better idea of the character of each for candor, generosity, and truthfulness. Dr. Holland quotes from one of Mr. Lincoln's unpublished manuscripts as follows, quote, Twenty-two years ago, Judge Douglas and I first became acquainted. We were both young then. He was a trifle younger than I. Even then we were both ambitious. I, perhaps, quite as much so as he. With me the race of ambition has been a failure, a flat failure. With him it has been one of splendid success. His name fills the nation, and is not unknown even in foreign lands. I affect no contempt for the high eminence he has reached, so reached that the oppressed of my species might have shared with me in the elevation. I would rather stand on that eminence than wear the richest crown that ever pressed a monarch's brow. End quote. Again, in the pending campaign, Mr. Lincoln said, quote, There is still another disadvantage under which we labor, and to which I will invite your attention. It arises out of the relative positions of the two persons who stand before the state as candidates for the Senate. 
Senator Douglas is of worldwide renown. All the anxious politicians of his party, or who had been of his party for years past, have been looking upon him as certainly, at no distant day, to be the President of the United States. They have seen, in his round, jolly, fruitful face, post offices, land offices, marshalships, and cabinet appointments, charge ships and foreign missions, bursting and sprouting out in wonderful exuberance, ready to be laid hold of by their greedy hands. And as they have been gazing upon this attractive picture so long, they cannot, in the little distraction that has taken place in the party, bring themselves to give up the charming hope, but, with greedier anxiety, they rush about him, sustain him, and give him marches, triumphal entries, and receptions, beyond what, even in the days of his highest prosperity, they could have brought about in his favor. On the contrary, nobody has ever expected me to be president. In my poor, lean, lank face, nobody has ever seen that any cabbages were sprouting out. These are disadvantages, all taken together, that the Republicans labor under. We have to fight this battle upon principle and principle alone. End quote. Now hear Mr. Douglas. In their first joint debate at Ottawa, he said, quote, In the remarks I have made on this platform, and the position of Mr. Lincoln upon it, I mean nothing personally disrespectful or unkind to that gentleman. I have known him for nearly twenty-five years. There were many points of sympathy between us when we first got acquainted. We were both comparatively boys, and both struggling with poverty in a strange land. I was a school-teacher in the town of Winchester, and he a flourishing grocery-keeper in the town of Salem. He was more successful in his occupation than I was in mine, and hence more fortunate in this world's goods. Lincoln is one of those peculiar men who perform with admirable skill everything which they undertake. I made as good a school-teacher as I could, and, when a cabinet-maker, I made a good bedstead and tables, although my old boss said I succeeded better with bureaus and secretaries than with anything else. But I believe that Lincoln was always more successful in his business than I, for his business enabled him to get into the legislature. I met him there, however, and had a sympathy with him, because of the uphill struggle we both had in life. He was then just as good at telling an anecdote as now. He could beat any of the boys wrestling, or running a foot race, in pitching quats or tossing a copper, could ruin more liquor than all the boys of the town together, and the dignity and impartiality with which he presided at a horse race or fist fight excited the admiration and won the praise of everybody that was present and participated. I sympathized with him because he was struggling with difficulties, and so was I. Mr. Lincoln served with me in the legislature in 1836 when we both retired, and he subsided, or became submerged, and he was lost sight of as a public man for some years. In 1846, when Wilmot introduced his celebrated proviso, and the abolition tornado swept over the country, Lincoln again turned up as a member of Congress from the Sagamon District. I was then in the Senate of the United States, and was glad to welcome my old friend and companion, Wilson Congress, he distinguished himself by his opposition to the Mexican War, taking the side of the common enemy against his own country, and, when he returned home, he found that the indignation of the people followed him everywhere, and he was again submerged, or obliged to retire into private life, forgotten by his former friends. He came up again in 1854, just in time to make this abolition, or Black Republican Platform, in company with Giddings, Lovejoy, Chase, and Fred Douglas, for the Republican Party to stand upon. Trumbull, too, was one of our own contemporaries. End quote. Previous pages of this book present fully enough for our present purpose the issues upon which this canvas was made to turn. The principal speeches, the joint debates, with five separate and independent speeches by Mr. Lincoln, and three by Mr. Douglas, have been collected and published under Mr. Lincoln's supervision in a neat and accessible volume. It is, therefore, 
unnecessary, and would be unjust to reprint them here. They obtained at the time a more extensive circulation than such productions usually have, and exerted an influence which is very surprising to the calm reader of the present day. Mr. Douglas endeavored to prove, from Mr. Lincoln's Springfield speech, that he, Mr. Lincoln, was a self-declared disunionist, in favor of reducing the institutions of all the states, quote, to a dead uniformity, end quote, in favor of abolishing slavery everywhere, an old-time abolitionist, a negropolist, an amalgamationist. This, with much vaunting of himself for his opposition to the Compton, and a loud proclamation of popular sovereignty, made the bulk of Mr. Douglas's speeches. Mr. Lincoln denied these accusations. He had no, quote, thought of bringing about a civil war, end quote, nor yet uniformity of institutions. He would not interfere with slavery where it had a lawful existence, and was not in favor of Negro equality or miscegenation. He did, however, believe that Congress had the right to exclude slavery from the territories, and ought to exercise it. As to Mr. Douglas's doctrine of popular sovereignty, there could be no issue concerning it, for everybody agreed that the people of a territory might, when they formed a state constitution, adopt or exclude slavery as they pleased, but that a territorial legislature possessed exclusive power, or any power at all, over the subject, even Mr. Douglas could not assert, inasmuch as the Dred Scott decision was plain and explicit the other way and Mr. Douglas boasted that decision as the rule of his political conduct, and sought to impose it upon all parties as a perfect definition of the rights and duties of government, local and general. At Ottawa, Mr. Douglas put to Mr. Lincoln a series of questions, which, upon their next meeting at Freeport, Mr. Lincoln answered as follows. I have supposed myself since the organization of the Republican Party at Bloomington in May 1856, bound as a party man by the platforms of the party, then and since, if, in any interrogatories which I shall answer, I go beyond the scope of what is within these platforms, it will be, it will be perceived that no one is responsible but myself. Having said thus much, I will take up the judges' interrogatories as I find them printed in the Chicago Times and answer them, seriatim, in order that there may be no mistake about it. I have copied the interrogatories in writing, and also my answers to them. The first one of these interrogatories is in these words. Question 1. I desire to know whether Lincoln today stands, as he did in 1854, in favor of the unconditional repeal of the Fugitive Slave Law. Answer. I do not now nor ever did, stand in favor of the unconditional repeal of the Fugitive Slave Law. Question 2. I desire him to answer whether he stands pledged today, as he did in 1854, against the admission of any more slave states into the Union, even if the people want them. Answer. I do not now, nor ever did, stand pledged against the admission of any more slave states into the Union. Question 3. I want to know whether he stands pledged against the admission of a new state into the Union with such a constitution as the people of that state may see fit to make. Answer. I do not stand pledged against the admission of a new state into the Union with such a constitution as the people of that state may see fit to make. Question 4. I want to know whether he stands today pledged to the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia. Answer. I do not stand today pledged to the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia. Question 5. I desire him to answer whether he stands pledged to the prohibition of the slave trade between the different states. Answer. I do not stand pledged to the prohibition of the slave trade between the different states. Question 6. I desire to know whether he stands pledged to prohibit slavery in all the territories of the United States, north as well as south of the Missouri Compromise Line. Answer. I am impliedly, if not expressly, 
pledged to a belief in the right and duty of Congress to prohibit slavery in all the United States territories. Great applause. Question 7. I desire him to answer whether he is opposed to the acquisition of any new territory unless slavery is first prohibited therein. Answer. I am not generally opposed to honest acquisition of territory, and, in any given case, I would or would not oppose such acquisition. Accordingly, as I might think, such acquisition would or would not agitate the slavery question among ourselves. Now, my friends, it will be perceived, upon an examination of these questions and answers, that so far I have only answered that I was not pledged to this, that, or the other. The judge has not trained his interrogatories to ask me anything more than this, and I have answered in strict accordance with the interrogatories, and have answered truly that I am not pledged at all upon any of the points to which I have answered. But I am not disposed to hang upon the exact form of his interrogatory. I am rather disposed to take up at least some of these questions, and state what I really think about them. As to the first one, in regard to the fugitive slave law, I have never hesitated to say, and I do not now hesitate to say, that I think under the Constitution of the United States, the people of the southern states are entitled to a congressional slave law. Having said that, I have had nothing to say in regard to the existing fugitive slave law. Further than that, I think, it should have been framed so as to be free from some of the objections that pertain to it, without lessening its efficiency. And inasmuch as we are not now in an agitation in regard to an alteration or modification of that law, I would not be the man to introduce it as a new subject of agitation upon the general question of slavery. In regard to the other question of whether I am pledged to the admission of any more slave states into the Union, I state to you very frankly that I would be exceedingly sorry ever to be put in the position of having to pass upon that question. I should be exceedingly glad to know that there would never be another slave state admitted into the Union. But I must add that, if slavery shall be kept out of the territories during the territorial existence of any one given territory, and then the people shall, having a fair chance and a clear field, when they come to adopt the Constitution, do such an extraordinary thing as to adopt the slave Constitution, uninfluenced by the actual presence of the institution among them, I see no alternative, if we own the country, but to admit them into the Union. The third interrogatory is answered by the question to the second, it being, as I conceive, the same as the second. The fourth one is in regard to the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia. In relation to that, I have my mind very distinctly made up. I should be exceedingly glad to see slavery abolished in the District of Columbia. I believe that Congress possesses the constitutional power to abolish it. Yet, as a member of Congress, I should not, with my present views, be in favor of endeavoring to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia, unless it would be upon these conditions. First, that the abolition should be gradual. Second, that it should be on a vote of the majority of qualified voters in the district. And third, that compensation should be made to unwilling owners. With these three conditions, I confess I would be exceedingly glad to see Congress abolish slavery in the District of Columbia, and in the language of Henry Clay, quote, sweep from our capital that foul blot upon our nation, end quote. In regard to the fifth interrogatory, I must say here, that as to the question of the abolition of the slave trade between the different states, I can truly answer, as I have, that I am pledged to nothing about it. It is a subject to which I have not given that mature consideration that would make me feel authorized to state a position so as to hold myself entirely bound by it. In other words, that question has never been prominently enough before me to induce me to investigate whether we really have the constitutional power to do it. I could investigate it if I had sufficient time to bring myself to a conclusion upon that subject, but I have not done so, and I say so frankly to you here and to Judge Douglas. I must say, however, that if I should be of opinion that Congress does possess the constitutional power to abolish slave trading 
among the different states, I should still not be in favor of the exercise of that power, unless upon some conservative principle, as I conceive it, akin to what I have said in relation to the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia. My answer as to whether I desire that slavery should be prohibited in all territories of the United States is full and explicit within itself, and cannot be made clearer by any comments of mine. So I suppose, in regard to the question whether I am opposed to the acquisition of any more territory unless slavery is first prohibited therein, my answer is such that I could add nothing by way of illustration, or making myself better understood than the answer which I have placed in writing. Now, in all this, the judge has me, and he has me on the record. I suppose he had flattered himself that I was really entertaining one set of opinions for one place, in another set for another place, that I was afraid to say at one place what I uttered at another. What I am saying here I suppose I say to a vast audience, as strongly tending to abolitionism as any audience in the state of Illinois. And I believe I am saying that which, if it would be offensive to any persons, and render them enemies to myself, would be offensive to persons in this audience. Mr. Douglas had presented his interrogatories on the 21st of August, and Mr. Lincoln did not answer them until the 27th. They had no meetings between those days, and Mr. Lincoln had ample time to ponder his replies and consult his friends. But he did more. He improved the opportunity to prepare a series of insidious questions, which he felt sure Mr. Douglas could not possibly answer without utterly ruining his political prospects. Mr. Lincoln struggled for a great prize, unsuspected by the common mind, but the thought of which was ever present to his own. Mr. Douglas was a standing candidate for the presidency, but as yet Mr. Lincoln was a very quiet one, nursing hopes which his modesty prevented him from obtruding upon others. He was wise enough to keep the fact of their existence to himself, and in the meantime to dig pitfalls and lay obstructions in the way of his most formidable competitors. His present purpose was not only to defeat Mr. Douglas for the Senate, but to, quote, kill him, end quote, to get him out of the way, finally and forever. If he could make him evade the Dred Scott decision, and deny the right of a southern man to take his negroes into a territory, and keep them there while it was a territory, he would thereby sever him from the body of the Democratic Party, and leave him the leader of merely a little half-hearted anti-slavery faction. Under such circumstances, Mr. Douglas could never be the candidate of the party at large, but he might serve a very useful purpose by running on a separate ticket, and dividing the great majority of conservative votes, which would inevitably elect a single nominee. Mr. Lincoln went to Chicago, and there intimated to some of his friends what he proposed to do. They attempted to dissuade him, because, as they insisted, if Mr. Douglas should answer that the Dred Scott decision might be evaded by the people of a territory, and slavery prohibited in the face of it, the answer would draw to him the sympathies of the anti-slavery voters, and probably, of itself, defeat Mr. Lincoln. But, so long as Mr. Douglas held to the decision in good faith, he had no more hope of aid from that quarter than he had already received. It was therefore the part of wisdom to let him alone as to that point. Mr. Lincoln, on the contrary, looked forward to 1860, and was determined that the South should understand the antagonism between Mr. Douglas's latest conception of squatter sovereignty on the one hand, and the Dred Scott decision, the Nebraska bill, and all the previous platforms of the party on the other. Mr. Douglas taught strange doctrines and false ones, and Mr. Lincoln thought the faithful, far and near, should know it. If Mr. Douglas was a schismatic, there ought to be a schism, of which the Republicans would reap the benefit. And therefore he insisted upon his questions. Quote, there is no business of yours, said his friends, attend exclusively to your senatorial race, and let the slaveholder and Douglas fight out that question among themselves, and for themselves. If you put the question to him, he will answer that the Dred Scott decision is simply an abstract rule, having no practical application. End quote. Quote, if he answers that way, he's a dead cock in the pit, responded Mr. Lincoln. End quote. Quote, 
but that said they is none of your business you are concerned only about the senatorship End quote. Quote, no continued mr lincoln not alone exactly i am killing larger game the great battle of eighteen sixty is worth a thousand of this senatorial race End quote. he did accordingly propound the interrogatories as follows one if the people of kansas shall by means entirely unobjectionable in all other respects adopt a state constitution and ask admission into the union under it before they have the requisite number of inhabitants according to the english bill some ninety three thousand will you vote to admit them two can the people of a united states territory in any lawful way against the wish of any citizen of the united states exclude slavery from its limits three if the supreme court of the united states shall decide that states cannot exclude slavery from their limits are you in favor of acquiescing in adopting and following such decision as a rule of political action four are you in favor of acquiring additional territory in disregard of how such acquisition may affect the nation on the slavery question the first and fourth questions mr douglas answered substantially in the affirmative to the third he replied that no judge would ever be guilty of the moral treason of making such a decision but to the second the main question to which all the others were riders and make weights he answered as he was expected to answer quote, it matters not said he what way the supreme court may hereafter decide as to the abstract question whether slavery may or may not go into a territory under the constitution the people have the lawful means to introduce it or exclude it as they please for the reason that slavery cannot exist a day or an hour anywhere unless it is supported by local police regulations those police regulations can only be established by the local legislature and if the people are opposed to slavery they will elect representatives to that body who will by unfriendly legislation effectually prevent the introduction of it into their midst End quote. the reply was more than enough for mr lincoln's purpose it cut mr douglas off from his party and put him in a state of perfect antagonism to it he firmly denied the power of congress to restrict slavery and he admitted that under the dred scott decision all territories were open to his entrance but he held that the moment the slaveholder passed the boundary of a territory he was at the mercy of the squatters a dozen or two of whom might get together in the legislature and rob him of the property which the constitution the supreme court and mr douglas himself said he had an indefeasible right to take there mr lincoln knew the southern people would feel infinitely safer in the hands of congress than in the hands of the squatters if they regarded the republican mode of excluding slavery as a barefaced usurpation they would consider mr douglas's system of confiscation by unfriendly legislation mere plain stealing the republicans said to them quote, we will regulate the whole subject by general laws which you participate with us in passing End quote. but mr douglas offered them as sovereign judges and legislators the territorial settlers themselves squatters they might be whom the aid societies rushed into the new territories for the very purpose of keeping slavery away the new doctrine was admirably calculated to alarm and incense the south and following so closely Mr. Douglas's conduct in the Lee Compton affair, it was very natural that he should now be universally regarded by his late followers as a dangerous heretic and a faithless turncoat. The result justified Mr. Lincoln's anticipations. Mr. Douglas did not fully develop his new theory, nor personally promulgate it as the fixed tenet of his faction, until the next year, when he embodied it in the famous article contributed by him to Harper's Magazine but it did its work effectually and when parties began to marshal for the great struggle of eighteen sixty mr douglas was found to be not precisely what he had promised a republican fighting their battles but an independent candidate upon an independent platform dividing the opposition mr lincoln pointed out on the spot the wide difference between mr douglas's present views 
and those he had previously maintained with such dogged and dogmatic persistence. Quote, the new state of the case had induced the judge to shear away from his original ground. End quote. The new theory was false in law and could have no practical application. The history of the country showed it to be a naked humbug, a demagogue's imposture. Slavery was established in all this country without local police regulations to protect it. Dred Scott himself was held in a territory, not only without local police regulations to favor his bondage, but in defiance of a general law which prohibited it. A man who believed the Dred Scott decision was the true interpretation of the Constitution could not refuse to Negro slavery whatever protection it needed in the territories without incurring the guilt of perjury. To say that slave property might be constitutionally confiscated, destroyed, or driven away from a place where it was constitutionally protected was such an absurdity as Mr. Douglas alone in this evil strait was equal to, the proposition meaning, as he said on a subsequent occasion, quote, no less than that a thing may lawfully be driven away from a place where it has a lawful right to be. End quote. Quote, of that answer at Freeport, as Mr. Herndon has it, Douglas instantly died. The red gleaming southern tomahawk flashed high and keen. Douglas was removed out of Lincoln's way. The wind was taken out of Seward's sails by the house divided speech, and Lincoln stood out prominent. End quote. The state election took place on the second of November, eighteen fifty eight. Mr. Lincoln had more than 4,000 majority of the votes cast. This was not enough to give him a majority in the legislature. An old and inequitable apportionment law was still in operation, and the majority of the members chosen under it were, as it was intended to by the lawmakers, they should be, Democrats. In the Senate were 14 Democrats to 11 Republicans, and in the House, 40 Democrats to 35 Republicans. Mr. Douglas was, of course, re-elected, and Mr. Lincoln bitterly disappointed. Someone asked Mr. Lincoln how he felt when the returns came in. He replied, quote, that he felt like the boy that stumped his toe. It hurt too bad to laugh, and he was too big to cry. End quote. In this canvass, Mr. Lincoln earned a reputation as a popular debater, second to that of no man in America, certainly not second to that of his famous antagonist. He kept his temper. He was not prone to personalities. He indulged in few anecdotes, and those of a decent character. He was fair, frank, and manly. And, if the contest had shown nothing else, it would have shown, at least, that old Abe could behave like a well-bred gentleman under very trying circumstances. His marked success in these discussions was probably no surprise to the people of the Springfield District who knew him as well as, or better than, they did Mr. Douglas. But in the greater part of the state, and throughout the Union, the series of brilliant victories successively won by an obscure man over an orator of such wide experience and renown, was received with exclamations of astonishment, alike by listeners and readers. It is true that many believed, or pretended to believe, that he was privately tutored and crammed by politicians of greater note than himself and when the speeches were at last collected and printed together it was alleged that mr lincoln's had been rewritten or extensively revised by mr judd judge logan judge davis or someone else of great and conceited abilities end of chapter sixteen part two recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida